All right, folks, good morning, good morning. I, I think there will be people filtering in throughout the day. I guess the first comment that I would make today is uh, next year there's going to be about four times as many people in here, maybe five. Uh, the organization is growing since December when we started. Uh, I have had so many fun, fun comments from people about the information that we're providing. Uh, it just makes me feel really good. One of the things that I'd have to say today is that uh, thank you guys for being here. I think it somewhat takes courage to be a board member that doesn't want to follow the mainstream. And there's so many board members right now that are just following the mainstream. And the most simple answer you can give anybody is student achievement. We're all about trying to improve student achievement. And we need to improve student achievement in Kansas. And you'd have to have your head in the sand to not realize the problems that we're having in the state of Kansas. And it's not only the state of Kansas. And just a quick plug, when we first started this in December, we have also had a meeting with, it's called SBAE, School Boards for Academic Excellence. And there were 16 states at that time, and we met in Kansas City. And we formed a group. And we have a man from California, North Carolina, and myself became trustees, uh, board of directors. And we are going to hire a, an executive director for that national organization, I think by January. We have the money, we've been approved 401C, and they love what we've done in Kansas, and they're copying a lot of our ideas nationally. There are so many organizations out there that are trying to improve education. If you notice that, all the different ones that are out there. And we're trying to find a way in the, each state to unite these ideas and work together to improve education. So the School Boards for Academic Excellence, their website's going to be up in three weeks. And it's going to be a great resource for us because now I can find out what's going on in Ohio and maybe use that to our advantage here in Kansas. There's a lot of people with a lot of good ideas out there. And I'm going to throw this out. Before we leave today, I'm going to be asking you guys to email me. We're putting together programs for December, January, whenever it's going to work, and what information do you need? You know, send me an email and say, Lord, I need help on, and I've had several great ideas from visiting with you people this morning. But if you see something that you think, boy, I'd like to get more information about that, simple email, we'll do the research, we'll put the program together, and we'll present it to you. So I'll be telling some corny stories as we go through the day. I try not to fall off the stage. I have this terrible knee that uh, I can't sue the doctors for screwing up. Uh, but anyway, I thank you guys for coming. I think it takes courage to do what you're doing. And I think of myself. I've been called a traitor, uh, all kinds of bad names by some of the education establishment. And my answer always is, Look at student achievement. Are you satisfied with what's going on? And somebody that knows more about student achievement and statistics and is one of the most intelligent men I've ever been involved with is a man named Dave Trobert. And I would like to introduce him to make a presentation right this moment. So Dave, come on up. So Ward, do you want the $50 for saying that now or later? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Dave Traubert. I'm CEO of Kansas Policy Institute. We uh, developed the Kansas School Board Resource Center. It's one of our subsidiaries. Uh, we also run the Kansas Justice Institute and the Sentinel. We put this organization together because we had a lot of school board members coming to us over the last two years, really. And, and telling us, uh, asking questions like, where did you get that information? Because that's not what I'm hearing from the state or from the state school board or my superintendent. And, and we really thought that we, we needed to have um, an, a, a way of working with people inside their school district and, and being a resource because the more we get into this, the more we understand that there's a lot of information that school board members don't get, and I, I don't want to speculate why, but we're just here to provide that. Now, I have to, I have the unfortunate task of, of laying out some rather ugly statistics on student achievement, but 
we, we have to do that. We have to be honest about where we are. It's like any other challenge. You know, you can't move forward until you first admit you have a problem and then start putting plans together to overcome those challenges. So I want to start with um, this first slide lays out, I want to uh, explain what the state assessment results mean because there's been a lot of uh, confusion, let's say, over that. The slide you're looking at here is what the state school board associate or the State Department of Education showed the legislature to, ex to introduce the new state assessment back in 2015. And it's really clear on the left-hand side, you see the little bracket that says at or above uh, grade level. And then on the right side, the top two are at or above for college and career readiness. So level one, by default, means it's below grade level. Um, now, I'm going to use, I, I use the college and career readiness. That's what is uh, the official. It's also the same as proficient. It's easier for me to say it and, and remember it. So I'm going to equate college readiness with proficient moving forward. Now, a few years later, the Department of Education kind of scrubbed the word grade level from their descriptions. And so this is their official definition now. So students have a limited ability in level one to understand and use material needed for post-secondary success. Uh, and then everyone, it's level two is the same thing with basic and then effective and then excellent. Um, there is, nothing's changed. I mean, the grade level may have been scrubbed from that explanation, but the cut scores are the same. Uh, level three and level four are proficient. That's what the Department of Education told the U.S. Department of Education. Level three and four is their focus for, I think their goal is to get, over time, 75% of kids in the proficient level. That's, that's the focus. Now, there's been a lot of push to talk about level two uh, as, as being good, as being on track for college and career. And, and they'll point to this definition. And yes, it all says even a limited ability. Uh, and and I'm, I'm sorry, that's just, um, that doesn't explain what's really going on. Uh, we also, I want to mention, because when we look at level two, we will call that, and you'll see that on the slides we provide, that it's at grade level but needs some degree of remedial training. And this is where that comes from. It was a, a policy adopted by the State Board of Education. Basically, this is saying to be successful in levels three and four, you need to be able to do everything without the need for remediation. So just a little background on that. Now, this is a trend. Um, we're just looking here at the percentage of students who are proficient. And 2015 was the first year that the state assessment was given. So with state assessment results, you can't compare uh, this state assessment with the one that was given in 2010, for example, because they changed the test and they say very clearly, you cannot make comparisons because they're different standards. So we can only go back to 2015 with the state assessment, and you can see that in 2015, and, and this is for all grades uh, tested, so it's three through eight and 10, 32% of the kids were proficient in math. And it was rather steady uh, in, in there in, until 2015, and then it started dropping, or 2019, I'm sorry, it really started dropping. Now there's 31% of kids proficient. Here's the really concerning part. The red line is the percentage of kids who are below grade level. They have a very limited ability. Uh, that has gone from 23% to now 33%. The English language arts are even more concerning. Here you see a really steady decline in the percentage of students who are proficient. Now, I'd say there's no right or wrong as to what that number should be. The Department of Education wants it to be 75%. Uh, you know, I think there, there's a lot of things we talk about in, in education that are right or wrong. What's this number? How much are we spending? But what should it be? How should we spend money? Those are really personal perspectives. Uh, and, and, and they aren't right or wrong in, in our view. So we're not saying what this should be. This is just where we are. And, and basically, if you're not happy with where we are, and certainly the trend, then we have to figure out what we're going to do differently. Because 
everything we've done to this point has brought us to where we are. And we take the approach that everybody has done their best, they've done what they think is appropriate, they, they have good intentions, but this is where we are. And if, we're, if we don't like the trend, then we're gonna have to do something different. And, that's, and again, that's not a right or wrong, that's what each of you have to determine working in collaboration with the, the staff in your districts. And, and so we'll help you arrive at what do we think those could be. We're not gonna tell you what to do. We're gonna help you uh, come to those conclusions on your own. This, in the below grade level in English language arts has shot up from 21% to 33%. And what you see here is uh, there was a slight uptick in proficiency and a slight decline in the percentage of kids below grade level in the 23 state assessment. It was very small, but you can still see the trend is not good. Yes, COVID had a, an impact on achievement. Part of that was honestly how each district chose to deal with it. Uh, everybody had a different approach to it. But what you need to understand is these trends were underway long before COVID. And, and now I want to, so these are the numbers. and. Uh, this is just an example. We can provide this level of detail. This is for all uh, students across the state. We can provide this information for your district. We can provide it down to the school level if you want. And so this is looking at the, the kids who were in 10th grade this year, 23, the kids who were in 10th grade, what they were, how their achievement progressed over time. So in 2016, those kids were in the third grade. And here we see there was 53% proficient in math and 45% proficient in English language arts. And what you see here is pretty representative in most districts where the percentage of proficiency declines. And what the experts say when you look at this is obviously these kids are missing something in the early years. Um, and and you have, we have to figure out what that is because it's only going to get worse. There's research that shows that if you are not reading at grade level, by the time you leave the third grade, there's only a 12% chance that you'll ever catch up. So it's a critical time, and, and we need to figure out what we can do. And the good news is there are a lot of good things that are proven that can work, and you'll hear about some of those later. Uh, this is the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Uh, it's the, or NAEP is the acronym. It is considered the nation's report card. It's, it's the way, it's the only real way that you can compare every state because it's a representative sample of kids in every state. They test fourth grade and eighth grade. They do reading and math. And again, what you're seeing here is a trend, um, especially in the focus in the blue box. Between here and 2017, there's been a remarkable change in the trend. It had been rather steady, and this is typical of what you see in most states, but there's a, a, an alarming increase in the kids who are below basic, which is like below grade level, and then an alarming decline in the percentage of kids proficient. You see the same thing in math. There's a trend here. And if you go to the ACT scores, now ACT is a little different because the participation levels vary from one state to another. Uh, basically states in the Midwest, uh, a lot of those kids will take the ACT. On the East Coast, those universities rely more on the SAT. So you might have 75% of your kids take the ACT, but only four or 5% take the SAT. And you can't really fairly compare states with wide disparate ranges in participation because if, if you have a lot of kids who, if they're all taking it, then you're getting a complete sample. If it's, say, 50%, it's probably the kids who are most likely really wanting to go on to college who are gonna take that test. So you're missing some of the kids. But we can certainly look at what's happening in Kansas. And again, now this here, this, this trend, downward trend started in 2015. There we had 32% uh, of students were considered college ready on the ACT. That's in English reading, math, and science. So they were college ready in all four subjects. And that's honestly not a high bar. 
Uh, ACT's bar on that is you have a 75% uh, chance or higher of getting a C on an entry-level college course. So we, we keep seeing these everywhere we go, we see these trends and we can't, they're not going to change on their own. That's, that's pretty clear. So one of the things that we have to look at is are the things that we're doing, and they may have been done with the best of intentions, is that part of the problem? And, and so in 2015, the Department of Education changed their approach. They, they put the program called Kansans Can in place. And honestly, it was, it was not designed to track academic uh, preparation. That's not even one of the key measures for accreditation any longer. Uh, the social emotional learning, you've heard a lot about diversity, equity, inclusion. We're not gonna get into that, but you have to look at what has changed. When you see a, a dramatic change in a trend and it's continuing, we have to start looking at what are we doing? One of the easiest things to do, well, it's easy in one hand, it's very hard in the other, is to look in the mirror. I'll give you an example. We have, uh, you, you've probably heard there's a, a tremendous increase in mental health issues in school. Well, are we doing anything as education professionals? I'm not, I, sh I just meant that's kind of the collective we. Uh, what are we doing that may be contributing to that? Because that's the easiest thing to fix. We just stop doing those things. If it's not working, we stop. Uh, not saying that's is, but we have to look at what are the trends? Where can we go? Where's the most likely place we're gonna find some information that might help us understand this. And we can never be afraid of questioning what we've done in the past. I mean, we, our attitude is everything we've done to this point has brought us here and everybody did it with the best of intentions. So there's no finger pointing, no one's to blame for where we are, but everyone is responsible for being part of the solution and moving forward. Uh, we know that um, just doing these same things over and over again aren't going to work and so it really comes down to board members and legislature and parents, all of us have to decide, are we going to accept maybe having a third of kids below grade level as the norm or are we going to do something to change adult behaviors? And there's a lot of things that can be done here. I wanted to mention there was a new audit that came out from the state that concluded, they were asked, the state auditors were asked to calculate the, uh, what, what amount of money would be needed to improve student achievement. And the auditors were, were refreshingly candid and said, you can't do that. Money matters. Money can make a difference, but only in terms of how it's spent. Just throwing more money in it the auditor said won't make a difference. And that's what most of the national researchers have concluded. So we have challenges like uh, another audit showed that school districts, uh, most of them aren't spending the at-risk funding according to state law. And the really concerning thing about that is that audit was came to that conclusion in 2019. In 2023, Another audit said, yeah, not much has changed. That's a problem. The at-risk money is provided by the legislature over half a billion dollars last year to provide above and beyond services for kids who are academically at risk. And that's not how the money is being used. So we're, this is, I, I get to be the bad guy here and tell you these are the negative things. This is what we have to look at and decide, are we willing to accept where we are or what do we want to do differently? And we are delighted that we were able to bring in uh, Mr. A.J. Crable to, um, to bring, um, bring a, a message to you uh, of what school boards can do. And Ward, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just, A.J., you wanna just come up?